Let's pray, and then we will get started. Hey, God, we come before you this morning humble, appreciative, thankful, God, that we get to be in your house. God, that I get the opportunity to look into your word and to speak truth. So, God, help me to speak truth today from your word. God, this is going to be a big day today. So God, I am asking you to ordain my words and my heart as we talk about some touchy subjects. God, would you be in this place and would you be honored and glorified by the things that we do say and think? And it is in the awesome, powerful name of Jesus that we pray, amen. Now you're probably going, oh my, what did I get myself into? And you are correct. My title for today is Biblical Responses to Current Events. Okay? I warned us a couple of weeks ago that we were going to be uh, hitting some big stuff. And I named it Biblical Responses to Current Events because I think the title of How Would Jesus Vote was a little too spicy. Okay? So we decided not to go there. But I want to give you my goal today. I have a very specific goal today, and I need you to hear this. This, you, You got to get this. My goal today is not necessarily to change anyone's mind about any topics. That's not really my goal. Um, Although if you have a different opinion about um, some of the things that we're going to be talking about and you do change your mind, that's great. My main goal today, because I understand this is a church, and I'm, I'm, for the most part, I'm shooting fish in a barrel, or I'm preaching to the choir. For the most part, we can all have different views and opinions, and I love that about us, okay? But I want, and I, I feel called, I feel led, and I have wrestled with God about this kind of back and forth. God, should I go there? Should I say this? Should I... And, and so, so God and I have, have had some, some tumbling recently, okay? But my goal is to give you tools as the church to have respectful, productive conversations with people around you. Because again, I know for, for the most part, m- most of you guys today are going are gonna to go, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah. Okay, so I'm not trying to convince you of something different necessarily, but I want to give you guys tools and handles to be able to have conversations uh, with people. Now, um, it, we're gonna, I have a lot to cover today, okay? I, I'm just, I'm warning you right now, we're going to go a little bit longer today. But I'll make you a promise, it's not going to be boring, Okay? I'll promise you that. Now, I want to start off with a question, okay? Besides worshiping God, and I really want us to think about this, what is our primary responsibility as followers of Jesus? Think about it. Besides worshiping God, you're to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And that word love is an action, not a feeling. So, yes, we're, we're to worship God. That's number one. But, but besides that, what is our primary function as followers of Jesus? I didn't catch any of that, but I'll give you the answer. Thank you for that. We are to be ambassadors for Christ in every area of life. That's what we are to do. Worshiping God is the most important thing. Next to that, second to that, we have to be, as the church, ambassadors for Christ in every single area of life. There is no compartmentalizing Christianity. We don't get to just take Christianity to our Sunday morning or just in our house or on one or two days a week. We are to be Christians all of the time. Habakkuk 2.4 says, but the righteous person will live by his faithfulness. We're supposed to live by his faithfulness. Romans 1.17 as well talks about that. That, that, that we have to be followers of Jesus all of the time. <clears throat> also, we talk about this a lot. There's no such thing as not offending someone with the gospel. We say this all the time. Oh, no, I, I, I don't want to offend them. They have different views. I don't want to share my faith because I don't want to offend them. And we often not offend them right into hell. 
So is there, is there a right way to do it? Absolutely. Do we do it in love? Yes. Do we talk to people tactfully? Yes. But there's no such thing as not offending someone with the gospel. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, For the message of the cross, that is the gospel, is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And our faith or our Christian values should be evident in everything we say, do, and think. That is just 100% biblical. In fact, we had t-shirts made. We may even still have a handful of them that we were selling. It says, be a 24-7, 365 follower of Jesus. That's what we are called to do. So here, here's some different areas. Yes, of course, you're supposed to be a follower of Jesus in your personal quiet time, but that's kind of easy, right? Um, you're supposed to be a follower of Jesus in your church. That's easy, right? Okay, so let's branch out. You're supposed to be a follower of Jesus in your family or in your home, and that's oftentimes where many of us start to kind of fall away. We're supposed to be a follower of Jesus in our community, again, doing it the right way, talking to people with love, with grace, but also with truth. And Last but not least, we are supposed to be followers of Jesus in our politics. <gasps> you can't say that word. Hmm. Christians aren't supposed to be involved in politics, right? You heard that before? Maybe you've said that before, right? Remember last week, I, I said a, a very big statement. I said, if the church doesn't stand up for what is biblically and morally right, who's going to do it? Who's going to do it? Who is going to do it? We were put here by God to speak truth. Again, and I'm, I'm going to say this until I'm blue in the face and you're going to go, Trevor, you've said that a thousand times. Yep, we do it with love. We do it with grace. We do it tactfully, but we do it with truth because that's exactly how Jesus did it. And I don't know about you, but I want to model the guy that predicted his death, burial, and resurrection and then pulled it off. That's the guy I'm going to follow. Okay, so if Jesus did it like that, that's how I want to do it. All right, so we can look through Scripture. I, I want to I prove this point a little bit, and then we're going to dig into it. There was a lot of Bible characters all throughout Scripture that were involved in politics and governmental affairs. We had God-fearing kings and judges, David, Solomon. Who did we talk about last week? Deborah. Deborah was a judge, okay, so... Uh, God-fearing kings and judges. We have high-ranking government officials in foreign, non-God-fearing nations. That's Joseph, Daniel, Nehemiah, Esther. We've got a witness to Caesar himself and other government officials. That was Paul. Okay, we've got a prophet that overthrows wicked king Ahab and Jezebel and anoints a new king. That was Elisha. Okay, we have a leader who liberated his people from a stubborn and cruel Pharaoh. Who was that? Moses, let my people go, right? And we have prophets that rebuked kings for their sin. So Elijah rebuked Ahab and Jezebel. John the Baptist rebuked Herod. Nathan rebuked David. So on and on and on, we see all of these huge biblical figures involving themselves in politics. But I left out one very specific person. Who do you think that was? It's the right answer for most questions in church. <laughs> Jesus. <gasps> what? Jesus got involved in politics? No way. Yahweh. <laughs> ah, Matthew chapter 27, or 22, verse 17. Sorry, had to do it. So Jesus, as he often did, is kind of butting heads with the political religious leaders of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the teachers of the law. It keeps mentioning these guys, and we see it constantly. Now, most of the time, they're coming to him and trying to throw him off and ask him questions. Here's one of those times. They say, tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites... Why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, 
whose image is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Jesus was instructing them, hey, obey the government as long as it doesn't supersede the law of God. That's very, very clear in Scripture. The very next chapter, here's another one, Matthew chapter 23, verse 23. It says, woe to you. And that, we don't understand how big of a phrase that is. That would have almost been like cursing them down. I mean, woe to you means you have no idea what's going to happen to you. It was, that was strong language. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. He's strongly criticizing these rulers. He says, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin. Now, interestingly enough, he talks about spices. Right here, it's, Jesus is talking about tithing. So if you, we don't think that Jesus affirmed tithing, he did. We're actually going to talk about this in a few weeks. Okay, But Jesus is talking about something that was written in the law. And he happens to mention mint, dill, and cumin. Like, I, I happen to think maybe one of those guys there had actually just tithed those things. So, I mean, he was getting all up in their grill. So he says, you give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the, what is that last phrase? The more important matters of the law. So wait a minute. There's kind of this weight. Jesus says, yes, there's some things that are even more important than tithing, just kind of following that part of the law. He says, You've neglected the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Notice, those are things that have to do with how people are treated and how you treat God. Way more important than tithing he was referring to, okay? You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. You blind guides, you strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. He's like, you're worried about the little things, but you're not worried about what's really important. And I mean, again, we don't understand how much Jesus was criticizing them, but, but, but they would have felt about this big at that point. And people would have been watching Jesus going, there is no way this guy is talking to them like that unless he really is the Messiah, unless he really is God himself. So, According to this verse here, what are the current more important matters of the law in regards to justice, mercy, and faithfulness? That's the question that we're going to answer today, at least partially answer that. But first, but wait, there's more. What about the separation of church and state? Ooh, love this topic. Anybody ever heard anybody throw that one right out there? Oh, separation of church and state. You can't do that. Trevor, you're a pastor. You're in the pulpit. You have to separate church and state. Hmm. Is that true? It's not true. I'll prove it to you, okay? Um, does anybody know where that statement is found? It's written down. In a letter, that's correct. It is not in the Declaration of Independence. It is not in the U.S. Constitution. It is not in the Federalist Papers. It's not in any of that. In 1802, President Thomas Jefferson receives a letter. It was a concern from the Danbury Baptist Association. Here's a little history lesson for you, okay? So he, he, Thomas Jefferson receives this letter from the Danbury Baptist Association um, about government potentially creating a national church about government basically getting involved in the church business so thomas jefferson president at the time receives this letter from the association and this was his personal response in regards to this concern and i want to read what he wrote exactly so he says, believing with you that religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God. Okay, so he's saying, hey, I'm with you. I believe that religion, your faith, is something only between you and God. Government has nothing to do with it and cannot do anything with it. That he owes account to no one other for his faith or his worship that the legitimate powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. 
I contemplate with sovereign reference that the act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature should, and then he, he throws a quote in there. Now he's quoting what was written down, what was in one of those documents, that legislature should, quote, make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, end quote. So he's saying it's already been a law that government cannot infiltrate into religious faith churches, okay? So then he, then he finishes it, thus, because of that law, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. That's where it comes from. So anytime anybody ever tries to say, hey, no, 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 you're not allowed to talk that here because of the separation of church and state, you can just refer right back to this. This is one of those tools I want to give you to say, that's not what was written. In fact, here's something really interesting. The law was written so that government would not infiltrate into religion, into the church. However, and, and you can go back and look at history, and to me this is fascinating. You can look at the, all the original laws, how they were written. They very purposefully and intentionally wrote religion and faith into the government, into laws. And there are people trying to erase our history because they don't want to face that. Because they don't want to recognize that the Bible, biblical principles, were written into government on purpose. Now, were all of those guys perfect? Nope. They weren't perfect. They had issues. There were issues of the day. There was a lot of other things that were messed up. But that was the intention. Government cannot have anything to do with church, but the church, faith, religion is very intentionally intertwined in government. Gary Hamrick says it like this, Therefore, the First Amendment is given to us in part to keep the government out of the business of the church, not the church out of the business of government. So, here's the question. Should Christians be involved in and speak into politics? We'll return back to our question, right? Well, let's flip this around. Okay, let's look at what would have happened if Christians did not get involved in politics throughout history. I'll say it in the positive way. Christians politically abolished slavery, gladiatorial combat, death games, temple prostitution, wives as property, infanticide, child labor, child marriage, child sex abuse, child prostitution, and class distinctions. So... Again, should Christians be involved in politics and political affairs? Uh, yes, because if they weren't, if we weren't, those things throughout history would not have been abolished. It's very clear. So, here's our question. What are the current more important matters of the law in relation to justice, mercy, and faithfulness? And I'll ask this in another way, a.k.a., what are the current issues on the table in 16 days? And as Christians, how should we vote? Well, before we get there, one more thing. And I've got to address this because I guarantee this is a question that is on many of your minds. You ready? What if I don't like either candidate? Got you, didn't I? It's a great question. It is an honest, great question. What if I don't like either one? As a Christian, I can't vote for either candidate. It's a valid point, okay? There is a, a song, and it said, you can't always get... You guys are sinners. <laughs> okay. Can't always get what you want. I'll put it this you can't always get 100% of what you want, right? I'll prove it to you. I'll prove it to you. You can't vote for me, no. I'm not getting in, in government, okay? No. You will never get 100% of what you want. Here's why. Anybody married? Okay. 
we're in church. Uh, I didn't even hear what's going on, and I probably don't even want to know. We're in church, so you can't lie. And don't, just don't raise your hand, okay? Did anyone actually get 100% of what they want in a spouse? Okay, okay. No, 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 no. I have a follow-up. If you did, I guarantee you your spouse did not. Okay? I did. Okay. All right. You can't always get 100% of what you want. But here's how we deal with this. What if I don't like either candidate? Valid question. Okay, Aristotle, I believe, first said it. He came up with this concept of the lesser evil, or we now say it, the lesser of two evils. Here's how I say it. Not voting is a vote for the candidate you disagree with. That's how I think of it. And that is 100% how I, I heard some statistics this week that will blow you away. I think Christians, about 40% of Christians don't vote. And, I, I, and if I'm, I'm remembering, because I heard a lot of statistics, I did a lot of studying for this this week. I think there are 90 million Americans that profess that they are Christians and 40% of them will not vote, that's staggering. A non-vote is a vote for the opposing party. So, all right, here we go. You guys ready? Everybody sitting down? Okay, here we go. Um, I've got a handful of topics that I want us to cover. And again, you may disagree with some of these. My point is to give us the biblical responses to these, not my preference. And, and my plan today, I forgot to tell you, my plan today is, except for one exception, not a primary candidate, but I, I am not trying to name any names or a political party because guess what? It has nothing to do with that, okay? I want to give you exactly what is in Scripture. So, um, except for our first topic, these are in random order, but I believe this first topic is the primary topic that we especially as Christians have to deal with, and that is abortion. Now, some people call it reproductive rights. That's just disgusting to me, okay? But before I dig into this, and we have in the past dug into this, okay, I just want to say this with as much love and grace uh, there is no condemnation here. If you have been involved with abortion in any way, shape, or form, there is forgiveness, there is love, there is grace, there is, again, no condemnation. I want you to know you are loved and you can be uh, 100% forgiven by God. I cannot imagine how it feels, the situation that, that women have faced, the, the, the circumstances and predicaments that women are in, I, I can't even imagine. So I, I, I barely feel worthy to even speak about this except my calling from God to preach the Bible. Is that fair? Okay, here we go. Um, uh, uh, about a year or so ago, I preached a sermon series called Tough Topics, and I did two weeks on this. It was called The Value of Life, All Life. And you can go back, uh, our, our sermons are on YouTube, and you can see those. But real quickly, I, I went through these five points. I want us to look at five biblical points on the value of life, all life. Number one, we are God's creation. We are God's creation. Now, again, this is just the biblical view. We'll touch on a tiny little bit of science, but this is just the biblical view. If someone is, is like, no I, just, no, I still feel like there are certain circumstances... This is what the Bible says. So number one, we are God's creation. Psalm 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has, what's that word? Made us. Does it take a man and a woman? Yes. But it is God who actually makes us, and we are his. So we belong to his. So number one, not only did he make us, but we also belong to him. We are his people 
the sheep of his pasture. So we are God's creation. Number two, we are made in the image of God. Now, this is a humongous theological statement. Don't have time to get all into it. But Genesis 1.26 says, Then God said, Let us, that's the triune God, that's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. We are made in the image of God. Imago Dei. We are fashioned and formed after God. Number three, we are made with great intricacy by God. Genesis 2, 7 says, then the Lord God formed a man, and that word formed is such a cool word. It's like fashioned, actually fashioned the man together from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. And remember, until this happened, Everything that had been created was spoken into existence. And man was the very first thing that it says that God touched to form. Pretty incredible. But you say, oh, Trev, okay, but that's an adult. Okay, the, I, don't, I don't believe that babies in the womb are actually babies. And it's funny that you have to say babies to not be a baby. Okay, it's just a fetus, which is a Latin word that means offspring. Okay, so Psalm 139, verse 13 here it is. For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Now, if there was not another piece of evidence, scientific or biblical, right there, that verse, that God himself knits us together in our mother's womb, that should be enough evidence that no matter whether it's one minute old or it's nine months ready to be born, that is made by God. That is God's creation. We are not to touch that in harmful way. For you created by inmost being, you knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am, oh, how does God make us? I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame, as this body is growing inside of its mother's womb, my frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. And it's just a clump of cells, right? No. We'll talk about that in a minute. Number four, we have been given eternity by God. Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time, he has also set eternity into the human heart. And again, this is what differentiates us from animals. P people like to dumb humans down and say, oh, we're just, you know, another animal. And I get how the animal kingdom works. Okay, all of that. But those animals don't have eternity in their hearts that was put there by God. Number five, last one. We are made with great purpose by God. Jeremiah 29, 11, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Okay, but that's adults. Okay, cool. Psalm 139, 16, your eyes saw my unformed body. Does anybody have any question on who we're talking about? This is babies, unborn babies in the womb. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Jeremiah 1.4. The word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. We have no right to harmfully touch any child that is in the mother's womb. For no reason whatsoever. Science. Talk about science a little bit. Science has proven that a preborn baby is not just a clump of cells. That was the argument for a very long time. Now, any scientist, even a secular scientist that knows anything, will not use this phrase anymore because they know it is not just a clump of cells. And if somebody says that to you, oh, well, it's just a clump of cells, say, well, you're just a clump of cells, okay? That's your response to them. <laughs> okay, science has proven that a preborn baby is not just a clump of cells. 
The age of viability continues to change as medicine advances. Okay, so the age, so, oh, okay, well, it has to be born. Well, it has to be nine months to be able to, well, science got better. And, oh, it can be in 30-some weeks and the baby will survive because science gets better. And then science and, and, and medicine got a little bit better. Did you know that we have a, a baby in this church? A beautiful, wonderful, amazing baby that I have held in my arms, dedicated right here on this stage, that was born at 26 weeks. The youngest ever is 21 weeks. So if that bar has to keep changing according to how much better science and medicine gets, what has to happen? We have to assume that life starts at conception because if the bar keeps moving, guess what? The bar is wrong. Life begins at conception. So I'll start again. Science has proven that a preborn baby is not just a clump of cells. The age of viability continues to change as medicine advances. No other conclusion can be reached except that life begins at conception. Really cool thing. You may not know this. I, I talked about it back when we did the Tough Topic series. Has anybody ever heard of the zinc spark? This is so cool. Okay. This blows me away. In 2016, scientists and researchers discovered that when the sperm meets the egg, it actually gives off a spark of light. There is a chemical reaction that light happens at the moment that those come together. Accident? Coincidence? I doubt it. God? Absolutely, because God is the giver of life. So, science has proven the Bible proves that you were known by and created by God before conception. We just covered that. Psalm 139 is probably the best source, but all of those other verses that I gave you, and trust me, there's plenty, plenty more. So, the Bible proves that you were known by and created by God before conception. Science has proved that it's not just the clumps of cells. Therefore, here's the conclusion. Therefore, anyone especially Christians, who chooses to be, quote, pro-choice, is choosing to conveniently ignore and deny science and God's word while justifying the murder of a child. I'm, I'm sorry, not sorry to say it so clearly, but that's the fact. And we, as people who are lovingly but truthfully going to talk to people about this, have to understand what is happening. You can go ask people. I watch way too many videos about stuff like this, okay? And there, many people have just resolved, yes, I know it's killing a baby, but I should be able to do it anyway. They just, they're just saying it now. And that's what we are dealing with. Frank Turek says this, the right to life is the right to all other rights. Without life, you have nothing. Being pro-life doesn't necessarily qualify someone as a good candidate, but being pro-abortion necessarily disqualifies someone as a good candidate. Boom. That's a mic drop moment right there. All right. So that's number one. The rest of these will get through much quicker than that. The second topic I want to pick on is the appointing of judges. Something that's very important that you may not have even thought about that is that important in a presidential race. Now, this is judges, Supreme Court justices, or federal judges. Uh, Isaiah 126 says, I will restore your judges as at the first, and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. When we have righteous judges, you, judges, you will have a righteous city. And the appointing of judges, Supreme Court and federal, it's an extremely critical part of the president's responsibility. Now, I told you I was going to make some big statements. And this next one is one that I really need us to understand because if we are going to fully grasp what we are dealing with in this election cycle, these are the types of things that we need to understand. I'll say it like this. Less listen to what people are saying and more 
Look at what people have done. We have a really great advantage this election cycle. We get to see both candidates and that have had four years of administration. Okay, one might not have been at the top, but was involved in pretty much everything. So, here we go. One candidate appointed three Supreme Court justices in his one term that helped overturn Roe v. Wade, 1973. One of our candidates that we get to vote on in 16 days purposefully appointed three Supreme Court justices that overturned Roe v. Wade. A law, a ruling that should not have been there in the first place because that's not how the Constitution works, and I'm not going to break it all down, and I'm not the best person to do it anyway, but that wasn't a legitimate ruling anyway, but it got overturned. Now, the other candidate is part of the current administration who appointed a Supreme Court justice that could not and would not give the definition of the word woman at a Senate Judiciary Committee meeting. We need to understand who we are dealing with and what we are dealing with. Not because I vote one way or another, not because I like this person or that person, because we have to understand the biblical ramifications of what is coming. The policies of each candidate stretch way far beyond their immediate position as president, and we have to consider that. Next topic, border security. Huge topic out there, right? God is in favor of borders. In case you're wondering, what, there's no, there's no Bible verses that talk about this. On the contrary, Acts 17, 26. From one man he made all the nations. Oh, so we have different nations. They're supposed to be, yes. That they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. This is straight from God in Acts. Psalm 122, 7, may there be peace within your walls and security within your citadels. Proverbs 25, 28, whoever has no rule over his own spirit. So, so pause for a second. This, you know, Proverbs is the wisdom book, right? And so it's just throwing out all this stuff and calling people fools and things like that. So this is so strong. It says, whoever has no rule over his own spirit, like if you have no self-control, you're nothing. It, it, it is like a city broken down without walls. God is in favor of borders. Now, we also have the book of Nehemiah. We have an entire book that was dedicated to a guy leaving one foreign nation, coming back to Jerusalem, and building the wall around Jerusalem to protect it. God is in favor of borders. And God is in favor of and established borders to safeguard nations from external influences. Here's why it's so important. Because we have to be careful of external influences for two reasons. Military and cultural influences. We don't see the military yet. I believe we will, unfortunately. But we are already starting to see the cultural ramifications and influences of things that are happening. And when too many people come into a nation at one time, I'm all for immigration done the right way. Absolutely. I love that. But when too many people come in at one time with different values, we have to be so cautious at that because they bring their values here and change what we have. That's why we are a nation. Because That's why we're here because that's what we believe. And we have to be so careful. God is in favor of borders. Here's our next one, biological sex. Very, very big topic. Genesis 1.27, we read part of this verse earlier. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That's it. Male and female. And in regards to the LGBTQIA+, and I say all of that not mockingly, I say it for a very specific reason, because it used to be the LGB and then TQIA+, 
And then they had to put a plus at the end. Why? Because it's growing. You see what's happening here because what they're saying is, well, you can be whatever you want. We can, we can just continue to stretch this category out as far as we want. It's, it's kind of, you know, you heard the story of the fisherman who went fishing. He caught a fish this big, right? It's that there is no end to it. That's me, by the way. <clears throat> so in regards to the LGBTQIA issue, God created male and female with the purpose of marriage and intimate relationships with the opposite sex. That's it. That's how he did it. Any deviation from God's original plan is the enemy's attempt to shape you into something contrary to God's design. That's what is happening. Anything different from what God created is the enemy's attempt to make you something that God didn't originally intend. And we don't get to decide to be something different from what God intended. And anyone who supports this is directly, or I'll have a little bit of grace here, indirectly supporting the enemy's agenda. Because that's exactly what is happening. And now, people will say, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? It's, it's, it's them. It's, that's how they want to live. It's not hurting anyone. Okay, right? That's what people say. Let's play this out. Fourteen states currently have, quote, transgender health care shield laws. Okay, have you heard of these? Where transgender health care, which won't even go there, okay, or you'll hear it as gender-affirming care. This is where people can go to their doctor and get either uh, chemical medicine or have surgery to change them from one sex to the other. Okay, 14 states currently have transgender health care shield laws. Now listen to this. I told you I was going to name one name today, and here it is. Last year, Governor Tim Walz signed legislation making Minnesota a trans refuge state. Okay, what does that mean? Here's, I'm going to quote Pastor Gary Hamrick because he says it better than I can. Here's his translation. If a minor child, parents, you need to hear this. If a minor child has been unable to attain gender-affirming care because one or both of the parents object, okay, parents will not let them go get this quote-unquote gender-affirming care chemically or surgically, the Minnesota law allows courts to have, quote, temporary emergency jurisdiction over the child so they can go get their gender affirming care governor tim walls who happens to be the vice presidential nominee signed that into law now i have a question and i don't have an answer to this question but i want to throw that out there for us to think about why is this so important to them Think about it. Think about how hot of a topic it is. And, and relatively speaking, and, and one person's enough, but relatively speaking, mathematically, the percentage of people battling with this is pretty small with gender dysphoria, which I, I believe is a mental issue that ought to be dealt with with love and care, but not surgery, not chemicals. But if the percentage of people is relatively small, why is it such a big deal? I want to ask the band to come up while I cover my last point. My last one is the support of Israel. And we just talked about this recently, so I'm not going to beat it too much here. But Genesis 12, 3 says, I will bless those who bless you talking about Israel, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. We must support Israel. That does not mean we have to agree with everything that Israel does. That, that doesn't mean that Israel is a perfect nation. They're not. None of us are. 
but it is extremely biblical and written all throughout Scripture that we have to support them. And we see people who are openly, openly against Israel, supporting terrorist organizations that are going at Israel. We need to be praying as a church for Israel, praying big time for them. I saw this yesterday. There was a political rally on Thursday for one of the candidates. And this candidate was speaking, actually talking about the other candidate who appointed three Supreme Court justices to to purposefully overturn Roe v. Wade. And as they were talking about that and talking about reproductive rights, a heckler in the crowd, a protester, screams out, Jesus is Lord. Did anybody see this? Okay, are you ready for this? If you've not heard anything that I've said today about candidates or about anything, you need to understand this because this is exactly what happened on Thursday. Somebody yells out, Jesus is Lord. And immediately the candidate said, quote, oh, you guys are at the wrong rally. Hmm. That's a big statement. That's a really, really dangerous thing to say. And what really scares me is there was no time to think about that answer. Scripture says, what's in your heart will come out of your mouth. That's what we're dealing with. I'll tell you this, kind of bleak, isn't it? It's a tough message. Here's the truth. No man or woman can be the Savior. Neither one is going to save us. I hate to break it to you because I've talked to a lot of people on both sides that think one or the other is going to be the Savior. Guess what? They're not. There is one Savior, Jesus Christ, who is seated at the right hand of God right now, who is in control of all things. That is the Savior. That is the person who we bow down to. One day he will make all things new. And until then, we have a job as the church. Again, here it is. In love, in grace, in mercy, done the right way at the right time, but truthfully. And hopefully I have given you some tools and some handles today to have these conversations. Do I think that our little church is going to change an entire federal election? No, probably not. But I will put my head down on my pillow today knowing that I did what I knew I needed to do and what God called me to do, and I'm asking you to do the same thing. All you're supposed to do is what you're supposed to do or what God has called you to do. One thing, God's gonna make all things new. I'll close with this. Until then... We have a responsibility as the church to stand up for biblical values, morals, and freedoms before they are slowly but steadily taken away from us. God, we come before you this morning. Knowing that you are in charge. God, banking on the fact that you are in charge. Not a man, not a woman, not a government, not a nation. But the most holy God is sitting on his throne in heaven. God, not a leaf falls from a tree, not a hair falls from our head that you don't know. And God, I take refuge in that. So God, help us as a nation to be wise. God, help us as followers of you to be wise in 16 days. God, individually, none of us can make a humongous difference, but God, we can do exactly what you have called us to do. So God, as the church, 
Help us to do that. And God, we know even bigger than what's happening in our nation is your kingdom. So God, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. God, we know light shines brighter in the darkness. So God, if this next four or however many years is going to be darkness, God, help us as the church to shine brighter. God, help us to be the people that you have called us to be. Help us to stand up for truth. Help us to put aside our preferences, our opinions, what we've learned before, influences around us. God, help us to put all of that aside and help us to stand on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ. Because what else do we have? God, thank you for the truth of your word. God, thank you that we know that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ. And God, I know that there are some here this morning who are probably a little uncomfortable. Maybe there are some here this morning that do not know you as their personal Lord and Savior. Right now in this moment, Lord, speak to their hearts. Let them know that they need you. God, I don't know what I would do if I did not have you in this broken world. But heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If that's you, if you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus, I'd love to give you an opportunity to do that. Right now where you're seated, just say to yourself, Jesus, I need you. Jesus, I desire a relationship with you. I've tried to do this on my own. I've just pushed you out of my life. Right now in this moment, I trust that you are my Savior. Lord, change me. Lord, save me. I give you my life. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. If anyone said that for the first time today, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you out or make a big deal, but i just love to pray for you and celebrate with you. Would you just slip your hand up and say, I got it today. I made Jesus the Lord of my life, my Savior today for the first time. Thank you. Jesus, you are so good. You are such a good God and you are worth following. God, help us to throw off any misunderstanding we had about you, but to understand that you are an awesome, gracious, and forgiving, loving God, but a God that demands us to give you our lives. Thank you, God, for the purpose and the responsibility that you have called us to in this life. God, help us to shine our light in the darkness, no matter what happens. God, help us to be bold followers of Jesus. And we pray all of this in the awesome, most holy name of Jesus. Amen. Would you guys stand? Hey, we're going to sing in just a minute, but if you would like, if, if you want to be prayed over, you're welcome to come forward. You're welcome to just come and pray by yourself. We're going to have people down here in the front that would pray with you, but we would love for you to just let us know, hey, I made a decision for Jesus. Let us know, but if you feel so led, come and pray.